Okay, well, I'm really happy to see everybody here tonight. Um, we are very privileged to have Beth Macy with us tonight, author most recently of Dope Sick. This is the second of three fall reading events that we're having, sponsored by the Friends of the Clifton Forge Public Library. Um, a reminder that on October 27th at 10 o'clock in the morning, we're, we have Julia Keller here, a uh, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist um, who is currently living in Ohio but grew up in West Virginia, who's going to be here talking uh, about her newest novel, Bone on Bone. Last October, we had the good fortune of having Beth Macy here at the Masonic Underground talking about her first two books, Factory Man and um, True Bond. And tonight, he struck gold again. Beth agreed to return to the Masonic Theater to talk about her newest book, Dope Sick. Dope Sick came out about seven weeks ago. It has received, justifiably so, huge acclaim throughout the publishing world. Um, thanks again to the Clifton Forge Public Library, the friends of the Clifton Forge Public Library, the staff of the Historic Masonic Theater, and especially to all of you for coming tonight and making this event possible. Beth's credentials are really impressive. She wrote for 20 years for the Roanoke Times and has won numerous awards for her journalism throughout the country. She received a Neiman Fellowship to Harvard in journalism in 2010, and her nonfiction uh, work has appeared in a lot of different journals and magazines, including the Christian Science Monitor, the New York Times, um, more recently in Oxford American, and the list goes on and on and on. Dope sick dealers, doctors, and the drug company that addicted America is a must read for all of us. In her book, Beth pulls off something that's very hard to do with hard facts, thorough history, and most of all, compassionate storytelling. She holds up the opioid crisis before her readers and says, here it is, we can't afford to look away any longer. Stanford addiction specialist, Dr. Anna Lemke, put it this way. All prior books on this topic, including my own, were written as if describing the trunk, the ear, or the tail, without quite capturing the whole elephant. Journalist Beth Mason, has packed the entire elephant and then some into one book. Copies of all of Beth's books are up here and Beth will stay after her presentation to sign any books that you care to purchase. Please welcome Beth Macy. from Giles County with me. Um, just really happy to be here and honored. Um, this is probably my 12th or 13th talk I've given since the book came out. So I'm just going to say that I, I'm going to just make the leap. And because I know there are people in the audience, I'll learn more about it later at the signing line, who have been affected by this epidemic. I'm sorry. It's a really hard we lost 72,000 people last year. Every one of them is a tragedy, as it was for their family and friends and their children. So Dosik is a national look at the opioid epidemic as I witnessed it landing over two decades in three Virginia communities that I believe serve as kind of a microcosm of what happened in the United States. 
from distressed rural hinterlands to cities and suburbs and eventually to even pristine farm towns because there's no place now where the opioid epidemic is not. I tell this story by getting close to the families and first responders who are fighting back. Honestly, it was the only way I could stand to live in the topic. I knew that going in. My friend Roland Lazenby, who's written a lot of books about sports, said to me, he quoted Mr. Rogers, he said, find the helpers. You do best when you find the helpers. The big picture as I see it, the opioid epidemic is festering and growing. It's taking advantage of long-standing fissures in American society. The fundamental differences between law enforcement and medicine, between punishing the addicted or getting them treatment for their substance use disorder. Now, I'm not a numbers girl. Anybody who's read my books would probably know that, but I have to understand them in order to be able to pick out the right stories that I believe represent them. These are the numbers, and I'm just gonna read the top one and the bottom one, because they're like the ones that made the hair stand up on the back of my neck. We have lost 300,000 Americans in the last 15 years to drug overdose, and we're gonna lose that many in just the next five. So it's a curve that looks like this, going back to the late 70s. As for opioid use disorder, it takes four to five treatment zone episodes over an average of eight years for an addicted person to get just one year of sobriety. So it's not an easy fix, and anybody who's had this in their family knows that. It's not something people try to get better from one time and they're better. Addiction is a chronic relapsing disease. This is my first book, Factory Man. It came out in 2014. It was about the aftermath of globalization in Martinsville and Henry County is kind of where I started from. I was writing about the Bassett family and how one side of the furniture uh, family had gone one way and all the other products and the other had fight, fought back from uh, gay labs. But so when I started reporting uh, around late 2012, here's what it looked like in Henry County, which had had the highest unemployment rate for over a decade in the whole state of Virginia. We saw a tripling of food stamps. Disability rates had gone up 64.1% just since China joined the WTO. Drug crime had skyrocketed, especially heroin and meth. People were doing things like stealing copper wiring from an abandoned Bassett furniture plant uh, with the goal of selling it on the black market. Now when I was finishing up Factory Man, the cops were telling me about this. I drove around with a Commonwealth attorney in Henry County and he said, yeah, there's a house where they broke in and sold the Xanax and here's a house where they broke in and sold the Oxycontin. And when I was thinking at the time, when I was thinking about the guy that, that burned down the fa factory accidentally, he didn't mean to set him apart. I was thinking, well, this is a person that needed to feed his family. He was unemployed, he had been displaced. I didn't think about what was really fueling about 80% of the crime, and that was the fact that so many people were addicted to opioids. And they weren't stealing just to pay their bills. They were stealing in order to buy drugs so that they wouldn't get what they called dope sick. Dope sick is what users call the feeling of withdrawal. They all say, almost to a person, it's like the worst flu times 100. It's diarrhea, nausea, sweats, vomiting, restless leg. Uh, as somebody in the book says, at the end of your journey, you're not snorting pills or shooting up heroin to get high. You're doing it so you won't be dope sick. Because the opioid epidemic initially took root in politically unimportant places in small towns like Bassett, Martinsville, I argue it was allowed to fester and take root. So in 2012, I was the family speed reporter for the run of times. And I'd been there a long time, and they would let me take time with my stories because I had proven myself. I'd been there like 22 years at that point. And uh, the, story one, the story on everyone's tongues at the time were the fact that not in a distressed place like Henry County, but in Hidden Valley, which is one of our wealthiest Roanoke County suburbs, 
heroin was really becoming a thing. And so I spent the summer of 2012 following these two, two families whose lives have been upended by heroin addiction. One, her son at the age of 19 had died from a heroin overdose. The other was about to go to prison for his role in selling the boy who had died, the heroin that ended his life. So he was about to go to prison for five years, five years, and he let me that summer follow him as he went through drug court in Roanoke County. And when this series ran in the Roanoke Times on the front page, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, readers like literally spit out their coffee. They went, what? Wealthy white kids are doing heroin? We had no idea. So much separated Spencer Mumpower and he's the kid who went to prison. His mom is a prominent jeweler, ginger jewelry. Maybe you've heard of that chain of jewelry stores and a civic leader of sorts in Rona. So much separated Spencer when he was arrested for Scott Ross death in 2010 from the Bassett arsonist. And yet, if you look at their jailhouse mugshots, they look almost identical down to the methamphetamine scratches on their face. They were both doing what they were doing to avoid being dope sick. In Spencer's case, he was selling in order to beat his own habit. In fact, Spencer had gotten started the way three quarters of heroin users today get started, by taking prescription opioid pills. Not necessarily prescribed to Spencer. In his case, he stole them from his mom's, from her medicine cabinet. I've heard that so many times. One thing you can do when you get home tonight, look in your medicine cabinets. If you have anything with codeine at the end of it, Lortab, Vicodin, Percocet, Oxycodone, Hydrocodone, that's an opioid. It's just like heroin. It's the exact same thing. You should take it to a drug take back in that, or some, some drug stores will now take them back. So I followed Spencer through drug court as he was preparing to leave for prison, um, through the perspective of the converging lives and their mothers. And I, I even followed him when he got out of prison earlier this year, if I update you at the end of the book. He got a service dog because he has really bad PTSD from being in prison for five years. In the interim, while Spencer was in jail, I followed both of their mothers. And I didn't, I didn't know I was going to write a book. I was just... I had gotten to know them, and so I kept in touch with them, as I do. I have hundreds of text messages from both of them. We had gotten close. So unlike, what I learned was, unlike in the distressed communities where factories were burning down, jails were overcrowding, people were stealing lawnmowers and weed eaters, breaking into pharmacies in broad daylight to steal Oxycontin as far back as 2000, in places like Hidden Valley in Rona County, where the Mumpowers lived, Hidden Valley, so accurately named, the epidemic grew unabated because of shame and also because of their wealth. It was easier to hide there if you were addicted because your money uh, occluded the reality of the situation. In the wealthier suburbs, kids like Spencer could hide it longer. They could say their iPad had been stolen from them when in fact they had taken it to the pawn shop to get money to buy drugs because they were already hooked. One mom told me it was like a dementor from Harry Potter descended upon Hidden Valley and said, I want you, I want you, I want you. So here's the first doctor in America who picked up the phone in the late 1990s and called Purdue Pharma and said, I know you say on your insert that Oxycontin is not addictive or addictive in only less than 1% of all cases, but I've got children I immunized as babies who are now showing up in the ER as teenagers overdosing on Oxycontin. I have children overdosing in the high school library. I have farmers in my practice, coal miners in my practice, people who could keep it together before Oxycontin came out, people who had legitimate pain injuries and would be prescribed immediate release opioids like Lortab, Vicodin, Percocet. And they would uh, have a legitimate injury, they would take their pills for whatever, however many days, and then they would be able to get them, get off of them. Oxycontin 
is way more addictive than less than 1%. And he begged them to take it off the market in those early years until they could reformulate it to be abuse resistant. One farmer told him, I lost my family, I lost my farm, I lost everything I have. That drug is my god. And yet, the company claimed that its brand new time-release mechanism, Oxycontin was supposed to bleed out over 12 hours, made it non-addictive. The FDA allowed them to make that claim. It used old data uh, that was, per, that was um, uh, studies that were done in hospital settings, not outpatient, to buttress its claim that Oxycontin addiction was, quote, exquisitely rare. It plucked a one-paragraph letter to the editor in the New England Journal of Medicine from 1980, hailing opioids, repeating it over and over until its contents no longer resemble the author's intentions, like a game of telephone gone horribly awry. <clears throat> the company hired an army of sales reps and sent them into communities all over America but where they really hammered OxyContin was in places where the jobs were going away. They bought data from a prescription data mining company that showed them which doctors in America were already prescribing the competing opioids, Lortab, Percocet, Vicodin, because they knew they were most likely to be susceptible to their sales pitch. So they went into their office, oftentimes bearing gifts, they would find out what a doctor liked. If it was Cuban cigars, they would show up with the very nicest Cuban cigars. They would show up with Christmas trees at Christmas time, with standing rib roasts, with all manner of things in order to buy their time to make their sales pitch that OxyContin addiction was exquisitely rare. At the time, Dr. Van Z in Lee County, Virginia, uh, Central Appalachia, Virginia's westernmost county, by the time he was calling them up and begging them to take it off the market, they were sending 5,000 doctors, pharmacists, and nurses to places like Florida and Arizona, some of them donning Oxycontin branded beach hats, as you see in this photograph. And they were paying them to become paid speakers for the pharmaceutical companies. They were then supposed to fan out in their communities and preach the gospel. They spent a lot of money on this.